<coughs> well, good evening. Um, for for those of you who are still looking for seats, there's seats up here in front, so so go, don't be shy. You can come up in front and sit. So my name is Kendall Lampke, and it's my pleasure this evening to introduce this evening's speaker. I'm the chair of the agronomy department. And um, <coughs> so I've known David for a long time, Dr. David Bergvinson, this evening's speaker. David's actually a native of Canada. He got all three of his degrees up there. David's actually from Van, um, Vancouver, British Columbia, where there's some, a small event going on there right now, I think, that some of us have been watching. But I want to read a little bit of a bio about David to give you a little bit of an idea of what he's doing now at the Gates Foundation. So David joined the Gates Foundation in March of 2007 as a senior program officer for science and technology within the agricultural development team. Um, before that, he worked 12 years in Mexico at the International Maize and Wheat Improvement Center and led their host plant improvement program for maize, which developed insect-resistant maize varieties for Africa and Asia using conventional and transgenic approaches. He also managed Simmet's, while well, Simmet is their drought breeding uh, network in Southeast Asia that resulted in development of several st stress-tolerant lines that have since been released throughout Asia and national programs. David has always emphasized the importance of involving farmers in the early stages of selection of experimental varieties to ensure high adoption rates, a philosophy he continues to follow at the, found, at the Gates Foundation to ensure our crop improvement grants remain, their crop improvement grants remain focused on improving the lives of smallholder farmers in Africa and Asia. He manages about 10 projects now, he tells me, up from the seven on my list, which I won't read them all to you. The total of project amounts on my list is around 127 million, so he has a lot of responsibility for uh, seeing that a lot of projects in Africa have impact. And tonight he's going to share some of the role of uh, the Gates Foundation in improving the lives of small stakeholder farmers in Africa and Asia. So, David, it's a pleasure to have you here this evening. Please join me in welcoming David. Thank you, Kendall, and good evening, everyone. Have a Monday night, and, and you're here. That's very impressive. So um, I'll try to make sure that uh, uh, this is uh, worth... Uh, not watching the Olympics and, and, and spending time learning about the Gates Foundation. So uh, with that, uh, I like to keep this fairly informal, so if there's some questions that you have as we, we roll along, please feel free to, to interrupt me. Basically what I want to do this evening is just give you a quick overview of the Gates Foundation, especially our involvement in agricultural development, and then to focus in on a few examples of the crop improvement grants that we support in order to improve uh, the productivity as well as the, the quality of staple crops in sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. And then to, to leave you with some parting thoughts about uh, the, the need for integration of not only crop improvement but marrying that to uh, good agronomic practices in order to in improve the profitability and sustainability of agricultural production in Africa and South Asia. So with that, I'd like to uh, start off by giving you an overview. So what do we focus on in the Gates Foundation? Well, we look for um, issues that impact on the most people, especially in our target geographies, issues that in the past have been neglected, especially in the recent uh, years. The last 15 years, we've seen a dramatic decline in investing in agricultural development, and, and we see signs now of that trend reversing gladly. So um, that's wonderful news and where we feel we can make the greatest impact. So looking at the landscape to see where uh, there is a neglected need that uh, we can address as a foundation. So when we look at uh, the role of agriculture in improving the livelihoods of smallholder farmers, that w when we look at those living below a dollar a day, uh, we see that the greatest concentration of poverty is found in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. And for that reason, we've, we focus on these geographies. When we look at uh, those living in poverty, the concentration of poverty is mostly felt or, or, or found in, in rural areas. And when we look at the role of agriculture in these uh, developing countries, agriculture accounts for roughly a third or more of the GDP of these countries. So it plays a, a central role not only in the lives of, of those who are the poorest, but also accounts for a large portion of the economy of these countries where we want to work. When we look at uh, the ability to agriculture to lift countries out of poverty, we see that really agriculture is the, the only engine that has repeatedly been the engine for broad-based economic development. And it contributes two to four times more uh, towards uh, development than non-agrarian uh, investments. 
and basically when we're looking at reducing hunger and malnutrition that agriculture is really the best vehicle to achieve these goals. So when we look back at the first green revolution that took place uh, under the, the leadership of Norman Borlaug, we see that uh, there were some, some real key lessons to be learned out of that. And basically what Dr. Borlaug and his colleagues managed to do was to bring together policymakers, good science, and the right uh, types of inputs, namely fertilizer and improved varieties that respond well to, to fertilizers, to uh, basically uh, double food production in South Asia. Th there was a prediction that there would be starvation of hundreds of millions of uh, uh, people living in India and Pakistan at that time. And basically in the course of a decade they managed to reverse that trend dramatic dramatically and resulting in those countries actually being in net exporters of, of wheat and rice. But uh, we see that this is true not only in, in the first Green Revolution, but investments in agricultural development have been probably some of the best returns on investment uh, internationally, whether it's Latin America, Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, that you know, we're seeing returns of uh, between 20 and 40 percent, which is, which is very good. And, and basically what we see is that agricultural development really needs to tackle uh, three major uh, issues that we feel are critical. One is production, that during the Green Revolution uh, the annual rate of increase in cereals was around 2.8 percent. Today it's less than 1 percent. Productivity, uh, we need to make the most out of the inputs that we, we apply to, to these crops and so especially around uh, water which is becoming extremely uh, in short supply in South Asia. And, and when we look at prices that uh, really uh, hunger is the breeding grounds for, for revolutions and, and uh, what we saw in the last uh, three years with severe price fluctuations that actually translated into um, rioting. So we, we, we need to, to focus on these three aspects and if we look at historically what has been the running average of, of annual gains in yield of, of the three basic cereals, maize, wheat and rice, we can see that on the, on the extreme left there that's 1969 and the annual rate of increase for all three cereals was between uh, two and a half and, and, and three and a half percent. Today though we see on the far right that wheat is, is below uh, half a percent annual increase, rice is about 0.8 and maize is about 1.7 and that is largely due to the large investment the private sector has made in increasing uh, the productivity of, of maize. So we can see a, a dramatic decline uh, due to lack of investment in crop improvement as well as improving agronomic practices for these three cereals. So our vision for agricultural development is that uh, we see agriculture as really, as I said, the base, the, the, the foundation for broad-based economic development. And our goal is to, to lift literally, a, our, our goal for Africa is about 150 million uh, smallholder farmers out of poverty, most of whom are women by providing them with the tools and opportunities to boost their yields as well as to increase their incomes. Um, so our, our approach is to focus on results that we're very much impact oriented as, a, as an organization you can imagine uh, with Bill Gates as our, our commander in chief if you will that uh, he's, he's very much focused on uh, making sure that our investments are successful. Building strong partnerships we see is really key, especially as we look at scaling up these investments and, and reaching this goal of over 150 million smallholder farmers. We really rely on effective partnerships. And we work across the full value chain, and I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. So when we talk about the full value chain, we're, we're looking in, in really two different dimensions here. One is across the continuum from basic research through to delivery of that technology to smallholder farmers which we see being only driven by uh, effective markets. And the, the other value chain is within our market access team where we're looking at creating either structured demand or value chains to make sure that farmers have uh, a good return on, on their agricultural production. So uh, within the Gates Foundation we're uh, focused on, on four different themes within the agricultural development team. Science and technology which accounts for about 35 percent of the agricultural development's budget uh, is focused on largely crop improvement but also agronomy research that will really leverage the very best in science to the benefit of smallholder farmers. 
Our farmer productivity team is focused on making sure farmers have access to those inputs, namely improved seed, fertilizer, education in the form of extension material and irrigation. And our market access team, like I mentioned, is focused on uh, value chains and structured demand. While our policy and statistics team looks at the issues that are needed to create the enabling environment for all of these other investments to really flourish. So how do we set our priorities as far as crops and the kinds of traits that we're looking for? So basically, we want to look at the crops that impact on the most people and where there's the largest yield gap between what we see on a research station and what we see on a farmer's field. And so taking this approach, it helps simplify our life of the very many options that we have available to us to invest to identify or focus in on the core crops, the staple crops, and where there's a, a large yield gap. And you can see that um, maize is, uh, for sub-Saharan Africa is our, our number one investment opportunity. Um, sorghum and millet also hold tremendous promise, um, as well as many of the legumes, which we see as being not only a critical element in improving human nutrition, but legumes, because they fix nitrogen, can be an important ingredient to improving soil fertility, which in sub-Saharan Africa is extremely low. Farmers just don't apply fertilizers in Africa. The average application rate is around 7 kilos per hectare. Uh, that's a very low rate. Uh, sorry, I can't uh, right now think of pounds per acre, but uh, it'll come to me in a minute. Uh, anyway, so that's the, the approach we take to setting priorities. And then within the crops, uh, we look at what are the constraints that each of those crops then faces, whether it be an abiotic stress like drought or low nitrogen uh, or a biotic stress like in, uh, insect or, or disease resistance. And based on, on these two parameters of, 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 of the area the crops cover and the importance of the different constraints, we, we develop uh, a strategy around where we want to invest. Uh, before I go on, I just want to mention that while we have focused a lot on crop improvement within the Gates Foundation, just because we see it as a high leverage investment, once we've basically developed a, real, a, a new variety that contains many of the traits farmers are looking for, it's very easy to scale that up um, through effective seed systems. Uh, the, the more challenging side is around agronomy and getting fertilizer, which is a very bulky, expensive commodity, uh, through countries that have very poor infrastructure, it, it's a very difficult challenge, but one we're trying to address uh, because we actually need both of these working together in order to really bring about uh, the transformational change that's, that agri agriculture holds. So within science and technology, we're focused on three areas. Uh, one is increasing productivity, just to, you know, the, the more the farmers can produce for the, a given amount of inputs, the more profitable agriculture will be. The other is to decrease risk. We see this as being very important because smallholder farmers are exposed to the vagaries of, of climate. Ninety-seven percent of the area in sub-Saharan Africa is what we call rain-fed. So there's, there's no, very little irrigation facilities available. So if the rain does not come, the investments that they've made are for naught because they won't produce a harvest. So if we can build in to the, to the genetics of these crops more uh, resilience against drought, pests and disease, that will then stimulate farmers to make these investments because they'll have some assurance that at least some of the harvest will be realized. And the third is improving the nutritional quality of staple crops, which is very important because there's a, there's a reason why there's not a lot of vegetables being grown. That's because there's not a lot of irrigation. So you have to sort of meet people where they are, at, where they're at. And, and in the case of the staple crops, we want to make sure that uh, there's nutri as nutritious as possible. So within science and technology, our grant-making priorities uh, are these. Crop improvement, which we see as having the highest leverage, as I explained earlier. Crop management, uh, which is important to go along with the crop improvement. And seed systems, the vehicle by which we, one of the important vehicles by which we deliver this technology. We see that for, for our grants to really have impact and be successful, there's a few filters that we're using to, to gauge the probability of success and to try to integrate these components within the projects themselves. So one is the need, as I pointed out, we want to find opportunities that impact on the most people. Feasibility, can we actually achieve this in a reasonable period of time at a reasonable cost? Uh, the concept of net present value, that if we can solve a problem today 
it's of much higher value than if we solve it five years from now, especially for a smallholder farmer who's desperate for this technology today. Comprehensiveness, that we, we look at a, our, our strategy as a, a complete portfolio and finding projects then that plug in to the gaps or holes within that portfolio is important. We see learning as being very critical to all of our grants, and it's an important, actually, reporting requirement for our grantees. And the reason for this is that as we launch these large grants, we're learning an awful lot about effective partnerships and how to take technology to scale. And we want to make sure that we plow that learning back into new grants so that we can even be more successful in the future. Leveraging, no one like, likes to stand alone when it comes to funding. So if we find, find partners to, to uh, uh, hold hands with us in, in investments, that's, that's desirable, but not necessary. Because uh, we will invest in areas that others are not willing to risk, uh, especially if we see a high potential return on them. Taking uh, technology to scale is very important to us, as I mentioned. Sustainability, not only sustainability in the project, but also environmental sustainability, as you'll see below. Uh, gender is really important for smallholder farmer, uh, smallholder farmers. Uh, you know, seventy percent of the poor are smallholder farmers. The majority of those farming are women. I mean, we have to make sure that the technologies that we develop are appropriate for women and meet their needs. And so through participatory approaches, we're able to make sure that our t technologies are indeed appropriate for women and to use the right messaging to make sure that women have access to those technologies. As I mentioned, environmental sustainability is very important. Bill Gates in his annual letter mentioned that, you know, we, we don't have to be uh, exclusive. You can't just have productivity and sustainability. We need to marry those two together, and I, we believe that it is possible. And to make sure that we pick the right partners that have the capacity to, del to deliver the technologies that are, are under development. Things that we've learned are very important in the proposal development process. Uh, as I mentioned, we've, we've, we look for grants that address elements of our core strategy. Um, we then look for who are the partners uh, that are most capable of delivering uh, that type of, of product or, or project. Then we look uh, at the proposal development uh, phase at the ability of the partner to develop a business plan. Uh, we see that that's really important and, and probably one of the new aspe <clears throat> aspects we bring to uh, project development is a real business approach to the whole process. And the way we do that is we look at what our end goal is and then work backwards in time to make sure that we have the key ingredients as far as milestones to metric our success as well as the key partners to make sure that we deliver against those. And then management of our, our projects is, is very key to achieve impact. And, and we really see ourselves as a, as a co-partner in these projects. If, if they fail, it's a failure uh, for the foundation and for the grantee. And so we really want to make sure that our grantees are successful and we'll, we'll do everything that we can to make sure that that happens. So terminology around uh, this space, you know, we go uh, every, on the left hand side you'll see inputs on the bottom, activities, outputs, outcomes, and impact. And, and this is important because on the left hand side we have a lot of control. We have a lot of control over the inputs, basically the dollar amount, uh, the activities, you know, the kinds of uh, activities that the grantees carrying out in order to to, to deliver the, uh, the outputs of the project, the outputs. But once we get uh, to, to outcomes, this is where we really need to engage with a broad set of partners to, to start having behavior change that will ultimately lead to impact at a large scale. And so to achieve this, we've actually been using um, part of what we call outcome mapping to facilitate this process. And outcome mapping is, is making sure that we have the right ingredients for success. And one of those is broad partnerships. We call them uh, boundary partners. Basically, they're, they're the partners that are going to be sort of the second layer, if you will, in that, that whole delivery chain. They're not involved immediately in the grant, but for the grant to become successful and really achieve impact, they're critically important. And so we bring them on at a very early stage to make sure they have a shared vision of what the project's trying to, to achieve and their role in, in making that happen. I put here just a list of, of some of the grants that, that we have around crop improvement. Um, I'm not going to read them all out to you, but I think the take-home message from this is that they're large grants. They're led by a single grantee, but they require a broad network of partnerships in order to achieve their goals. And I think one of the big challenges is, is just making sure that those partnerships work effectively. And 
um, the process that I described earlier really helps us meet, uh, meet that goal. So I'm going to talk to you about a few of the projects in a little bit of detail and just some of the key elements of them. And one of our early largest projects was this one, Drought Tolerant Maze for Africa. It's a project that's led by CIMIT, and it really addresses this issue of risk. As I mentioned, Africa is predominantly rain-fed agriculture. Maize is the predominant crop on the continent. And so the importance of drought tolerant maize is, is, is really critical for smallholder and bar, in farmers to improve not only their productivity but their willingness to a, assume a, a greater risk in applying other fr, uh, inputs such as fertilizer to in, further increase their productivity. And the approach that we've, we've taken with the drought tolerant maize has largely been conventional breeding. But I put this slide up here just to show you that we're working um, with a wide range of partners to achieve this common goal of drought tolerant maize. So, so while we're using molecular markers to accelerate the genetic gains for crop, for, for in this case maize improvement for drought, we're also looking at transgenic approaches in partnership with the private sector. And I think this is, this is an important point that we're really looking at these very broad partnerships in order to deliver uh, a, a fairly complicated product in the shortest possible time. And, um, I think that's one of the luxuries of the Gates Foundation is that we can encourage those broad partnerships that may not have uh, been realized in the past. In all of our crop improvement work, we see pheno what we call phenotyping, the ability to characterize the performance of that plant or that particular variety under a controlled environment. And for drought, we've established several, several controlled drought screening sites in Africa for that very reason. Um, because without high quality or what we call precision phenotyping, we're not going to make the genetic gains that we really strive to, to, to achieve. And so um, this is um, one real central point. Uh, and, and, and Bill picked this up right away when we were teaching him about molecular markers. And, uh, and, and some, uh, I won't mention the scientists' names, were saying, well, we don't really need phenotyping anymore. We've got all these wonderful markers. And we're just going to use more of them to compensate for poor phenotyping and and he basically said garbage in garbage out and that you know phenotyping is has got to be right and so I was impressed that he caught that concept at a very early stage in our our teaching I'm actually afraid he's gonna pass all of his by in about two years so we've got about a two-year window to get all this done before he starts uh, really critiquing what we're doing so so some of the outputs that come from these grants are not just germplasm but also the tools that will help others uh, be more effective in crop improvement improvement. And, and the Drought Tolerant Maze for Africa has developed, for example, electronic field books that will help uh, breeders and national programs manage their breeding uh, programs and, and trials. Uh, there's, there's also uh, other resources around genomic data that uh, through a, a variety of tools help breeders look for uh, qualitative trait loci that can be applied to their, their breeding programs and so forth. One of the big challenges we have is the seed sector. Unlike here in the United States, the seed sector is not that well developed in most of the developing world. And our, our challenge is really one, to create awareness about the problem and importance of the seed sector. And the other is to achieve impact in a short time despite a, a very weak seed sector. So we're trying to handle both of these challenges concurrently. And, and to do this, we really need to make a roadmap again of, of what are our goals in seed production. So year by year and country by country in which this particular project is working, we're mapping out our, our seed production targets in partnership with not only the public sector but also small seed companies and providing them, the seed companies uh, that is, with the tools to be a successful business in order to achieve our target uh, by 2016 of, of 70,000 tons of, of drought tolerant seed. I mentioned briefly the importance of an enabling environment, and this was really one of the important ingredients of the first Green Revolution. Dr. Borlaug was a scientist, but he wasn't timid, and he took the uh, politicians head on when it came to policy issues that were impeding the adoption and, and, uh, of, of new technologies. And I think as, as scientists today, we need to take up that same challenge, that while we're very focused on our research, we need to recognize the need for advocacy and, and communicating our, our message to the public, training, you know, educating them about the importance of the work that you're doing. Um, I think that's, it's, it's really critical. And, and to, the, to, to the stakeholders that um, are going to benefit from, from your research, and in the case of, of the agronomy department, uh, farmers in, in Iowa, in your case. 
I want to talk a little bit about a, a new project that we've just launched, uh, actually last week. It's a molecular breeding platform, and, and the idea of this grant is to really pull together dis the disparate efforts around molecular breeding and bring them under one umbrella so as a, as a larger community we can really leverage this new and powerful resource of, of molecular markers to further accelerate genetic gains. And it involves a broad partnership, really a consortium, uh, of both the public and private sector and a whole suite of donors who have a shared interest and vision to make molecular markers a reality in sub-Saharan Africa. And like all of our work, there's a really busy slide, but the point is we're mapping out all of our work, even in a project like this. And I think it's important. We need to have milestones in order to gauge our success and help us stay focused because a project like molecular markers can take us in any one of a number of directions but we need to keep our eye on the prize if you will and make sure that uh, we develop tools that are practical and ultimately result in better varieties in a shorter period of time. Another grant that I'd like to highlight is our stress tolerant rice for Africa and South Asia. This project is focused on developing rice varieties for the rain-fed areas, areas that were bypassed by the first Green Revolution. And basically, over the course of 10 years, we want to reach 18 million people with these varieties. Uh, we, we anticipate that already, just after three years, the end of, of 2010, we will have delivered seed of these varieties to a million farmers, so we're well on our way to achieving this goal. And, and the exciting thing about this is these are really transformational technologies. In the slide to your right, basically what you see is uh, our rice varieties. The ones that are green here are the ones that contain a single allele called sub-1A. Ba basically this gene allows the plant to arrest its development when the plant's underwater. A normal rice variety will try to outgrow the, the level of the water and exhaust its carbohydrate reserves. What this gene does is basically tells, sends a signal to the plant that give it up, you're not going to pass the water, so wait until it comes back down. And, and, and so um, the plants don't exhaust their carbohydrates reser reserves and they survive. And so this is really important because these uh, areas where you see no rice growing, a farmer will have to come back in and replant those areas and it's a lot of time and money wasted to replant rice. And quite often in South Asia, re-transplanting takes place three times before a farmer is successful in, in establishing a rice crop. So this is really important. And, and we use uh, participatory variety selection to help us identify those varieties that are most appro appropriate for smallholder farmers. And you can see here that several women are represented in, in these discussions as we go to the field and identify the varieties that are most appropriate for, for them. This, the, <clears throat> sorry, this tool of, of PVS, as we call it, not only helps us identify the varieties, but starts to uh, provide a spark for policymakers to recognize the importance of these varieties and, and revisit policies that have, over the last 30 years, really slowed the release of new varieties. Uh, it also generates uh, interest in the farming community so that once these varieties are available, they're quickly adopted. And uh, all I want to show is in the, in the top left panel here, uh, this is this sub-1 variety in India, and you can see in 2009 we basically didn't have any seed. In 2010 it looks like we don't have any seed either, but you can see that towards the end of the year we, we will have seed. We'll have probably around uh, 8,000 tons of this seed. And from then on it really scales up very quickly. So you can expect over the next three years some significant stories to, to be rolling out of India on the impact of those rice varieties on smallholder farmers. The last grant I want to talk about, because it, it brings together the complexity of the issues that lay before us, is a serial systems initiative for South Asia. It's basically a partnership between the Gates Foundation and USAID. It involves a range of research centers. So we call them the Consultative Group for International Agricultural Research. One focused on rice, one focused on maize and wheat, another one focused on policy, and one focused on livestock. And basically we want, we want to bring all of these elements together, not only on the crop improvement side, but also on the agronomy side. And this is our opportunity to really marry and optimize the improvements that we're making in, in crop genetics with advances in uh, conservation agriculture, particularly around water conservation and soil conservation. 
So we're going to be working in the endogangetic plane uh, where rice and maize uh, are irrigated. It's a very intensive cereal system uh, that feeds uh, well close to a billion people. So it's an extremely important cropping system or agroecology that we're, we're trying to address. The important thing too in this area is that the water table is dropping by a meter a year, uh, which is really startling. And, and pretty soon irrigation is going to be very costly and very limited. And so we need to address this emerging threat. So how are we doing it? Basically, we're, we're pulling together natural resource management, crop management, and crop improvement together to provide what we call ecological intensification of that cropping system. It's a big challenge. It's, it's knowledge intensive. And so what we're going to be using is geographical information systems to layer different types of knowledge so that we can provide location-specific recommendations. So this is an example of this. We're using uh, a weather surface combined uh, with, that has, provides 10-day weather forecast information, along with models around pest outbreaks, layers uh, for soil uh, fertility, layers for where varieties are most appropriate, and we'll be able to combine all of these using GIS tools. And, and an example is uh, for this location-specific intelligence, this is an example of fertilizer, uh, where we need to either apply zinc, iron, or manganese in order to make the crops really responsive to other inputs. And you can see the variation in these colored bars across one state in India and the importance of having this kind of information in hand and available at a very local or granular level to, to really make an impact. And with the advancement of information communication technology, we don't, we don't only have that on our computers, but we can have that on our, on our cell phones even. And with the revolution in cell phone technology uh, in developing countries, we see this as a, a tremendous opportunity for us to connect all the dots and making sure that farmers have access to this technology in a very timely and location-specific manner. So uh, we've gone through a lot of topics here, and, and I'd like to open it up to, to questions you might have. I want to close off in, in a statement Norm Borlaug made shortly before his passing last year that he said, take it to the farmer. And, and he was, I think, committed to that statement throughout his professional life. And really, I think all of us can aspire to uh, the work ethic and, and uh, the dedication that Dr. Borlaug had to agriculture and, and his full recognition of the impact that it can have in lifting literally millions of people out of poverty. And so I just encourage all of you in the work that you're doing uh, wherever that research is focused to make sure that you are targeting your research to have a very practical uh, impact on the community you're trying to serve, whether that be here at home or, or internationally. And uh, I just encourage you to consider a career in international development. It's a very rewarding one. The challenges are going to be tremendous over the next 30 years, and, and it's your generation that's going to need to face them head on. So I, I think... Uh, You've picked a wonderful time to be considering a, a career in agricultural research, and uh, I just want to encourage you to, to consider uh, using your skills to the benefit of smallholder farmers in the developing world as well. So with that, I'll entertain any questions if you have any.